This is Catonia, the world of the dark feminine. Hello, and welcome to this month's Catonia Conversations after, you know, it seems to be more and more sporadic um, as I've been doing them. But um, I'm really happy this month to uh, to welcome back uh, Dr. Joanna Madlock. Um, Joanna's been on the show before. We we did the uh, Baba Yaga podcast together, and we've also had some discussions of dark feminine in in Slavic Slavic folklore and myth and so forth. So welcome, Joanna. It's good to have you back on the show. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you, Bridget, for having me. Yeah, always, and and people love you. I I always get messages. People are saying, "When is when is the, when is Joanna coming back on to the show?" So um, you know, so you've got a little sub fan base here within in Catonia as well. People who uh, were oh, very interested. Thank you in so much for saying this. <laughs> it's it's, it's, it's <laughs> yeah, great, and, and I'm very excited to do this because uh, if you heard if you listened before, uh, we were talking a bit about Slavic stories and how sparse the materials are and how really difficult this uh, this research is because of the lack of the written sources. And there are many, 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 many problems here. You know, like the vastness of the territory, the differences between people, like think about how much like geography we cover here, right? Yes, uh, And how, you know, how this culture is split later and... Uh, and there is no no lack of significance of the, the 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 fact that many of these nations and many of these cultures were under control of other cultures for a very long time, like you know, like Poland under the Germanic or Austro-Hungarian, that suppressed these stories, right? And again, I, I'm I'm Polish, so I'm kind of talking from the Polish point of view of the stories, you know, and like how they were hijacked by by Russia because of the bigger culture, and they started to tell the common Slavic stories, like day stories, right? So what I'm using today, it's the book which I found absolutely fascinating and also an amazingly great source, and also the sign of time uh, of the revival of the stories. This is a book which was written in Polish. Uh, I'm showing it to you. This is uh, pretty recent, and as you can see, because mythology kind of spells similarly in all the languages, uh, this is an attempt to write the actual mythology. This is not a collection of fairy tales. This is not a collection of stories. This is not your common, you know, this is what we tell children to sleep well, or quite opposite. Right, right. Not the didactic tales. Yes, right. Yes. <laughs> So this is an attempt in mythology, in Slavic mythology, but this is written uh, by Polish authors and some of the names are given in Polish. Uh, so I'm going to spell a lot here. It's just okay, to that's give fine. you an idea. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah, it's interesting because yeah. we, we had been talking initially about how, in our past discussions, about how, yeah, there, there seems to be less of a mythology and it seems to be more of a folklore. And um, and and, as, and to your point, I mean, yeah, what is what is Slavic? What is what we think of as being sort of pan-Slavic, which I think is the way sometimes it, this is addressed, but that isn't necessarily quite how it works either. You know, we, there's um, I don't know. It, it's it's it, it definitely um, what what we've learned so far seems to fall more into the um, it, what like I said, reminding me of ancient Roman religion. You know, with with the um, the way in which you have like these these deities of you know the forests and of the flora and of the fauna and of the rivers. And and that this is this is the um, you know th this is the crux of it. But this, like you're saying, this is actually an attempt to bring together some kind of a mythology, a, a creation story, a theogony, you know, a, and this sort of thing. So anyway, didn't want to interrupt you, but I uh, just thought I'd you no, know. no, absolutely. This 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 is not retro. It's just conversation because actually you made me think about something else. Because when I'm when I'm going to talk, you will probably notice like from time to time. Uh, things are going to look very familiar, and those of you who are very much in Norse into Norse mythology can raise their hands and say, like, wait a minute, I heard this story before, right? Or those who are into classical mythology, obviously, the stories are not, like, nothing is 100% original. These people heard these other stories, they incorporated them, they found them fun or interesting. You know, this is like playing, you know, this fun... Mm -hmm. All right, you we incorporate the stories we like into our own stories. So, okay, without a further ado, yes. I'm going to talk a bit about creation. 
And please don't take it as, you know, some sort of scientific research. And there's no <laughs> research. And I bet there's going to be a hundred of people who are going to, to disagree. Uh, but how can we know, <laughs> right? So I'm, I'm just a storyteller yeah. here. Okay, so at the beginning, in Slavic mythology, there was heaven and sea. Okay. And there was one god, and this one god's name was Perun. Perun, which means uh, thunder. Mm -hmm. So here we are, right? Uh, right? Thunder, and his attribute is hammer. And he's the god of the sky, thunder, and lightning. And he looks like your proverbial Zeus mm. or Odin. He's an old man, but somehow in his prime, he's tall, strong, with long hair. He's bearded. His hair and beard are silver. He, we meet him in a story when he sits in his boat and he's going on a ride in his boat under the sky that belongs to him. And he's been like this for a while, obviously. We don't know where he came from. We don't know what he's doing. We know that he gets bored and lonely. Mm -hmm. How human, right? Yeah, right, right. Mm -hmm. So he gets bored and lonely and he looks around and there's absolutely nothing. Uh, there's nobody to talk to. There's nothing to look at. So he looks what anybody would do, down into the water. And what does he see? He sees someone else, or does he see himself? He sees a reflection, or is this a reflection? Because this reflection is him, and it's not him at the same time. Okay. It looks like him, but it's like a negative of him. It's dark-haired, it's dark-eyed, it's different. And he starts talking to this reflection. Is he going crazy because of loneliness? Or just he realizes that there's someone else there. So he starts talking to this person reflection. And he asks this person reflection for a name. And this person reflection says, I'm not going to tell you my name unless you take me to your boat. So it's like, unless you invite me in. Mm-hmm. So Perrin is struggling with this idea of taking someone else who looks strong and somehow dangerous into his boat, but he's also very curious and, let's not forget, very lonely. So he takes this person reflection into the boat and this person climbs in and he gives his name as Valles. Mm -hmm. And this is somebody who comes from the water. And here we introduce the second god. So we have Perun, who is the god of the sky, and Valles, who is the god of the water. But it's most like the god of the void. Okay. Because water is perceived as never-ending void. Mm -hmm. So they sit in this boat, they talk, they enjoy each other's company. But because there is two of them now, uh, all these ideas start developing in a dialogue. So they come to the conclusion, how about we create something that we can walk on? How about something that we can get out of this boat? Uh, there is no questioning like where the boat came from, nothing like this, but... Yeah, that, yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, yeah. There's no a disbelief there, yeah, right, yeah. <clears throat> no logic in mythology. Uh, so Perun sends Valles into the bottom of the sea to bring some land. But mm. he says, this is not going to go with you just like that. You have to claim it in my name. But you can see like from the very beginning, this is like Gilgamesh story in a way. There is uh, tension between them. There is friendship and there is tension between them. They, they start to like, kind of competing. So Valles jumps to the sea. This is, after all, his dominion. And he gets some, uh, some soil from the bottom. And he says, I claim you in my name. And he gains the instructions. But he emerges to the boat, and he has nothing in his hand. So he repeats the exercise. He again says, I claim you in my name. He gets back to the boat and there is nothing in his hand. 
So the third time the charm, he gets some soil from the ground. He says, I claim you in the name of Perun. And he gets up to the boat. Oh, on the way, let's mm -hmm. not forget, he picks up stone. Mm -hmm. Attention to the soil. He picks up the stone and he jumps to the boat. He presents the soil to Perun. And now it worked because he's obviously not that strong as Perun is. Mm. And Perun throws this land, throws this dirt to the air, and the land springs from this. So they create the land together in a way. And Perun, exhausted by this ex exercise, I don't know why it was Valus after all who, who was I know, he did put all our work here, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. All the work. He falls asleep. And when he falls asleep, uh, Valus <clears throat> attempts to throw him back to the sea. So, but every time he's trying to drag him to the sea, when he drags the sleeping god, more earth is created. Ah, okay. So he cannot, cannot fall into the sea. Mm -hmm. And eventually he wakes up, obviously, right? If you've been dragged so much, you wake up. He gets angry. The gods start fighting. Uh, and this fight is actually interesting because... Don't, don't forget the stone. Valus has the stone that brought, he brought from the sea. He throws it at Perun, but he doesn't harm him. But in the process, the, the stone splits into two. And Valus takes his half of the stone, <coughs> throws it to the sea, and he creates a great dragon from this. And Perun takes the second part of the stone and he strikes it with thunder and he creates the great serpent. Oh, interesting. And this, yeah, and these two are going to fight forever. And there's a big fight between them. Between these two serpents, really? The, the, yeah, but one of them is called dragon, the other one is called serpent, just to know which one right. is which. Okay. <laughs> and, there's uh, a differentiation, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And he takes Valus and he throws him to the sea. But when Valus is thrown into the sea uh, from his mouth, because seemingly he, when he was diving, he swallowed a lot of sand or this dirt. Uh, from his mouth, the mountains are created. So the land is not going to be even. Mm -hmm. And also when they are fighting, and the fight is pretty even, they tear each other's hair. And when this hair becomes entangled, the huge tree gets tree created. And this tree is going to be a tree of life. So you can see a lot of Norse mythology here, right? So, so, yeah. you know, this is like Yggdrasil growing and this tree is growing like rapidly. And Perun is going to take the top of the tree and Valus is going to come because he's like technically speaking in the sea, but this tree is growing into the sea. He's going to live in the roots of this tree. Uh, the great serpent eventually overtakes the great dragon, and the great dragon is going to be chained in the bottom of the tree by the Velas's uh, throne, and he's there like chained. He's on a chain. And he's yanking on the chain and non-stop. And you can imagine this yanking is like earthquakes, all this kind mm -hmm. of things. But also uh, he's yanking the strongest in the spring. And Perun gets afraid that the dragon is going to get away. So this is why in the spring he's throwing thunder at this chain, like reforging it. And this is how you get the spring thunderstorms. Ah, okay. You have, you have echoes of, of a typhus here as well. Yeah, yeah, it's like a yeah. lot of a lot yeah. of influences you can see, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, where am I? Uh, hey, hair. We talk about hair. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, so when these two dragon serpents were fighting. There's a lot of debris left by them on Earth, scales and feathers. So Valas, who is now in the underworld, but he can still sneak out 
This is not like tournament. Again, you have like this idea of tension, like with the Loki being thrown into from the underworld, that mm -hmm. he can get out any minute. And mm -hmm. his presence is going to be signified by the fact that he takes all the scales and he spits into them. And from this, all the little dragons are created. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, Perun collects all the feathers. And he creates little serpents. So this is like this tension between different kind of uh, elements because this is this nonstop fight, ongoing fight. Like the idea that uh, the universe is not uh, not stable. Mm -hmm. But also at the same time, uh, please don't perceive Valus as a completely negative force. No. Not like idea of that he's evil. Mm -hmm. but, like, <clears throat> more complicated, I would say. And also, a lot of credit is taken from him. Mm -hmm. he's, just, he's just like second in a way. He's like this uh, reflection and not reflection kind of thing, right? It's like he right. wants to be like Peron, but he cannot be like Peron. And there's a lot of frustration and anger, but there is also a lot of something like goodness. When you think about the creation of life, generally this is mostly Valas's work. Mm -hmm. uh, Perun takes care of the celestial universe. But what walks among us, what we are, I'm getting there, it's the it's the work of the darker gods. Right, the catonic. Well, that's just it. That's the whole thing of we we get so focused on the on the celestial. And the story is interesting to me so far because it's obviously this like it, it it plays into that whole theme that I think we see in a lot of creation myths about the tension between opposites. Um, you know, Gaia and Uranus, and you know the 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 castration that separates them. You know, um, <clears throat> you know even even the Garden of Eden. I mean, that's that's like you know you eat the fruit and now all of a sudden there's there's the separation of things, there's this difference. So here what you have, you have these two forces, one that's represented, one is like void and one is sky. And they, they're they sort of friendly with each other, but they're also in conflict with each other. And the lightning is often that, because when we think about storms, I mean, storms are that breaking of that tension, right? That's the breaking, yeah. you know, it's really been hot and dry and it breaks the rain, it breaks, you know. So, and also very interestingly in, in a lot of myths, you know, the, the storm god, whether you're talking about Zeus, whether you're talking about Jehovah, whether you're talking about their, you know, you're to Odin. I mean, they're the they're the king of the gods. Uh, Indra, you know, the the king of the gods. Lu, they have the thunderbolt. Yeah, so, yeah, because this is the strongest, this is the most. That's what people fear the, the most, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, yeah, apparently, yeah, it, apparently, it's this this idea of this fire in the sky. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, so that's considered to be the the mark of the king. Yeah, um, really interesting. Yeah, interesting. So. Um, so yeah, so that's so that's interesting. I don't know if you had anything else to say on creation because one of the things I'm curious about. Yes, is, you do. Okay, I'll let you. I'll no, let you. No, no, no but you can. You, okay, because you know, like what what's very interesting for me here, it's like that he, he's we we are not sure if there are two people there, right? It could be like one person, like kind of split personality, <laughs> this order situation, right? It's like him and not him. It's like me and not me. Is this my reflection? Is this like? My my alter ego, right? Is like what Peron is doing, but what you said, like really, this separation, right? Is like oneness, and then suddenly, and once we it perceive start, things, as it cannot be stopped, right? Because now we have different kind of elements, and now we are going to have light and darkness, day and night. Because what Peron does, he immediately because Peron is also the god of order. Yeah, right? yes, like the order requires that opposites. Yeah, the celestial gods are gods of order. So mm -hmm. he starts like separating Earth, what is going to be like this entire dominion, from the upper sky. And for this, he needs like a dome. So if you think Stephen King the, 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 under the dome, yeah, it's like yeah, right. live under the dome. So he builds like a cupola. So what we see, it's not really the sky, according to the stories, but it's what the gods created for us. Ah. It's not the real thing. You can't see the real thing, right? Yes, because he's the real thing, right? And only he knows the real thing. And he creates this copula and he makes this opening. And this is like the northern star for us. This is the only element of the real celestial light we can see. The, 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 the primeval, the first one. Everything else is what he creates. 
Ah, interesting. So, it's, an illusion. It's, it's assumed to be an illusion. Yes. Yeah. So it's like not the real mm -hmm. thing. And he creates a god. Yeah, the border. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, he creates the god. And uh, can I write it in chat? Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll I'll transpose this for uh, you know when when I post. The uh -huh. Okay, podcast. that's yeah. his name. He creates this god. Ah, uh, okay. How do you say that name? Farouk. Okay. This all with the this is an u sound. Okay, it's yeah, I would not have gotten that right at all. Yeah, so. I know. That's why I'm <laughs> That's why you're you could be. That's why you're it. <laughs> yes. So. so he creates this god to the <clears throat> of the celestial order of the proxy. Okay. Uh, he's going to be a god of light, but also the god of like of the tame light. Uh, think Hephaestus, mm -hmm. because he's also a blacksmith. Right, or Vulcan or Hephaestus, yeah, right, yes. okay. Yes, yeah. so he's a blacksmith, he's a protector of life, he's a protector of light, and he also makes tools. And the first thing that he does, that he makes, is the spear for Perun. Mm. So it's like a th thanks to the creator, right? Uh, and you can even you can even see farther of the separation of light and darkness, the copula, right? And the copula is going to be put in motion, and the axis is the tree of life. Ah. So everything revolves <clears throat> around the tree of life where Peron sits and Dallas resides. So Svaruk becomes this god of the light that gods create. But he's not sun. And wait for this. Oh, we got another name coming here. Yeah, but I'm not even sure if the letters like this up oh, here it is. Okay. Okay. I see it? Yeah. There's a lot of consonants, as you can see. This is pronounced Dutch book. Dutch book? Dutch book. And it, it literally means the God that gives. Okay. And this is the sun. Ah, okay. Uh, because Svaruk is given a job to, create, to, to take care of the light. But Perun tells him, now you will have to carry this light for Earth. From east to west. And he says, like, I don't want to. I like <laughs> what <laughs> I'm doing. So how about I eat another proxy? So this is another god of light. And this god of light is going to be given a task. He's going to be pushing this light from east to west every day. Mm -hmm. To be practical. And, you know, it's like... Perun is very powerful, and Svaruk is very powerful. Dashbuk is more like the funny god. Even if he's a god of light, he's more like the funny god. He's like smaller. He's uh, very prone to like tricks. He's like not very reliable, I would say. Okay, so he's a bit he's a bit unpredictable. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But he becomes a big part of creation when it comes to vegetation, obviously, right? Uh, so he's the one, thanks to whom the earth is going to get vegetation. So everything springs to life <clears throat> because of him, but not people yet. Okay. Not people yet. So it's a trickster who actually brings yes. about that kind of life. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yes, everything like happens. You know, he's not really thinking about it. But please notice there is no female gods yet, or goddesses. Right, right. Okay, yeah, that's right. This is very masculine mythology. Mm -hmm. It's very patriarchal. So, let's go back to Valets for a second. Valets gets jealous. Because all this creation is happening somehow without him. So he also creates a proxy. Okay. The god named Hors, you don't pronounce this C. Mm -hmm. <coughs> it's Hors. And mm -hmm. this really means month or month or mm -hmm. 
ah, okay. This this channel it's it's a it's a it's a moon in Polish. Okay, but it also means a little prince. It is like old Slavic, the the the, the smaller like the minor prince. Gotcha. Okay, because he's second after the sun, and Valis tells him, "Follow Dajjibok. We have to see what they're up to." Ah, okay. So, yeah, obvious, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh so his son is going to follow to follow Peron's uh, grandson in a way, right? And he's like nonstop spying on us, but on, not on us, on the entire earth. But why is he doing this? Not only he's jealous of Peron's uh, power, but he also takes care of things. He wants to know that everything is right because every time things things go bad, he actually gets out of his underworld's uh, kingdom and he brings things in order. So we would collapse without him. That's interesting because he's not technically a god of order. In, in a way, that, that almost reminds me of the role of the Furies, you know, the idea that they are the boundary setters. Absolutely. That's what I wanted to say. He's yeah. like the incarnation of that, right? It's like... Mm -hmm. uh, Technically speaking, he's removed, he's like the shadow character, he's not there, but when Por Perun and all this, his, his sons created of light, they are losing control, he steps in and he goes back to his world. And in the stories I left, there's a moment when they actually meet mm -hmm. and they don't talk, but they kind of acknowledge each other with a nod. It's like, okay, so you're doing your deeds. Mm -hmm. it's yeah. good you are here after all <laughs> it's like we're not going to say it out loud but yeah mm -hmm. yeah right. interesting so Okay, we don't know like it's the Dutch book creates life like by the powers of light and everything comes to being including animals the first animal that's mentioned in the story is a horse and as you can guess Perun immediately claims the, the horse for himself and mm -hmm. he becomes the first rider with his hammer and his spear and he controls everything. And he also becomes a great hunter. Mm -hmm. He's really into hunting. But among all these animals, eventually, finally, steps Mokosh. Okay. The first female character in this story. Ah, and okay. actually, she's a beautiful woman. We don't know where she came from. This is not the gods who created her. This is more like implied that she's one of the animals. Okay. So she's like the spirit of, of life, but she's also a giver of life. She walks around and whenever she steps, more life uh, appears. appears. Mm -hmm. And eventually, as you can imagine, she attracts the sight of Perun, who likes her a bit. We still feel a bit lonely, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, he's still a bit lonely. Mm -hmm. And together, getting another name here. They mm -hmm. create the sun. And this son's name is Stribuk. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and he also wants to be a giver of life because everybody around him seems to be a giver of life and he doesn't have a job. So mm. what does he become? He becomes wind. So ah. he's spreading all the seeds, everything around. He's the busy, the, the busy god. He's always in movement. He's like funny. Uh, obviously, Perun or Mokosh are not going to raise him. So he's given to Dajjibuk, who is like the one who is equipped to raise children because he's a funny and he knows how to tell a joke. And he's like a child himself. And he really, they, they really get together. And you can see why, right? In nature. So we have the gods of the winds. Mm -hmm. Now, things are getting even more complicated. Uh -oh. uh, Perun and Mokosh are technically speaking a couple, but Perun is not very much into relationships. 
Yeah, uh, not the yeah. Yeah. sort. Yeah. yeah, he's not the man. But there's no one else there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess he's monogamous by by proxy, unless he just starts like. Well, no. anyway, we don't want to. We don't want to go down that road. But yeah. Yeah. No, the story says he really likes hunting, so Mokosh gets long. Now Mokosh gets lonely and disillusioned and sad, and she sits by water very very long times. And because she sits by the water, you can imagine who sees her, right? Ah, okay. So eventually, Valis is going to notice her. And Valis comes from the waters to Mokosh. And just before Valis meets Mokosh for the very first time, Perun took a bath. And when he was taking a bath, he emerged from water and he took some straw and he cleaned himself with the straw, or he, he, he dried himself with the straw, and he threw the straw, straw on the side of the lake, or the water, whatever it is. I imagine it's a lake. Don't think about it as a lake. Right, right. right. My imagination. And he threw the straw there, and when Valus comes out of water, he takes the straw, and he mixes it with clay, and he attempts to give it life. And when Mokosh sees what he's doing, she also takes some clay, she also takes some straw, and she also attempts to give it life. But they can't. Mm -hmm. okay. But they eventually get together, they mm -hmm. have sex. All right. Mm -hmm. And these creatures are becoming like partially alive. Uh, like not completely alive by this act of the sexual act between Valis and Mokosh. Uh, these first humans uh, are mm -hmm. getting some sort of like animalistic life, but they are not completely alive. Only after the deed is done, Perun finds this. Perun finds it's like the dolls, and he breathes life into them. And this is how first humans are created. Obviously, from Valas, the man, from Mokosh, a woman. Okay. Also, Mokosh, because she's a symbol of fertility, conceives. And she's going to give birth to another child. And this is easier okay. because his name is going to be Rod. Rod. Hey, there you go. Okay. <laughs> and he's different. Uh, he's like a darker, dark-eyed, very solemn god, uh, tall and quiet. And yes, this is when the story becomes even more complicated. Mokosh likes him a lot. Uh oh. <laughs> and with her son, she's going to give, when, when she has sex with her son, uh -huh. she's going to give birth to three girls whose names are Rodzanica, the collective okay. name of this. Uh, both these words imply giving birth. Okay. So there's like element of giving birth, like in in like uh, uh, in the way that this, these words are created. Mm -hmm. Okay. She's trying to hide these children, but you know from other stories that this never works. No, no. Mm -hmm. Aaron is going to find out. He finds out. He gets really angry, mm -hmm. and he takes this anger on people. Ah, okay. <clears throat> because he cannot really do anything to Malkosh. Mm -hmm. And he cannot do anything more to Valis. But he can punish these young gods. And he can punish people. So he says, like, all the people from now on belong to Valis. And you oh. are going, you, Rod and Rodzanitsa, you are going to take them there. Which means people have to die. Yes. And after they die, they go to Valis. Okay, so that's why they have, they have these semi-divine well they're, they're they're almost listed as quasi-divine and then they have this sort of dual nature that's both animalistic and yes supposedly spiritual if we want to think of celestial as spiritual but then eventually he gets mad and so he's in other words he's conferring mortality upon them they yes it's interesting because uh, actually what i was going to say as you were talking here was that i'm thinking about the fact that you have this this deity that's associated with the sun who's this kind of trickstery you know childlike kind of figure who's 
weirdly not very orderly, but then that the other being that's kind of created because of the jealousy of Daleks is, is this, is this moon god, moon god. And when I think about it, I said, you know, the moon to me I, with the month, it's the idea of measurement. So once you start getting into measurement, now you're getting into time. Now you're getting actually towards mortality. So yeah, it, it's, it's weird. It's almost like he's following up with this, but it's, but they're kind of happening in different spaces, you know? It's, it's, yeah. It's, yeah. And, and <laughs> no, no, it, it gets even better. It gets better. Let's hear it. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. people have to die. Right. And yes. we, we learned Jaws. We just learned. That they have to die. And when they die, mm -hmm. they go to Valas. And mm -hmm. Valas creates a place for them. This place in the old Slavonic is called Nav. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because I read the Polish book, it's called Navia. Mm -hmm. So this is like afterlife. Okay, there we go. Okay. And this is Valas's afterlife. But, you know, when you think about Valas and people would think that Valas is evil, this is not hell at all. This is actually paradise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is like the ideal life. So the place where people would go to live forever, but uh, no hunger, no cold, no war, no sicknesses, no everything which our ancestors knew very well. Mm -hmm. So this is like the lack of suffering kind of place okay so but every person has two souls mm -hmm. okay I, I was feeling this but okay go ahead mm -hmm. you, you saw it right this double i saw two. it coming i know there's more than one soul going on here but go anyway go ahead <laughs> so what goes to now is this kind of life soul created by valas in this first act of creation uh, this human part, the individual part, what we lived, what we suffered, what we loved, what, you know, like this is individual, this is like our, our own emotions, everything. And we've been so tired by life that we need to rest. Mm -hmm. And now is a place to rest. Okay. <clears throat> but when people started to die and they started to come to Valas, he realized that everybody has two souls and the second soul did not belong to him. Mm -hmm. The second soul was restless. The second soul wanted back. The second soul uh, was more than an individual soul. Mm -hmm. And Valets called Rod and Rodzanice and told them, see this? This is not right. They do not, they do not belong here. Take them back to Perun. So Rod and Rodzanice go back to Peru up the tree, leading all these souls, the second souls, to Peru. And when he meets them, he realizes that Valas is right. Because the second soul is the collective soul. This mm -hmm. is not the soul of the human with the individual life, but the second soul is like the soul like the collective soul of humanity, but in this case, like of the family. Okay. <clears throat> so he creates the place for them on a tree, and it's called Virai. Okay. And he's going to keep the souls on the tree, but not forever. Okay. What else leaves? What, what else lives in a tree? Birds. Birds. So every time the birds, the, the, the winter starts, and think about this Slavic mythology, there is a long three, four months of winter with snow and cold. The trees, the, the, the birds, which, which would disappear from humans' life because they go south. Humans, right. don't, they don't know it, right? <laughs> they don't right. know that they, they are going to Egypt, right? Like the Polish strokes go to Egypt for summer, for, for winter. Mm -hmm. People didn't know it. They, they just knew they disappeared. So where did they go? They went to Perun. Where do they, where, where do they spend winter? Oh, on a tree. So people would think that the stalks or other birds, they went to Perun and they spend winter on a tree together with the souls in Virai. 
And in the spring, when they came back, what did they bring with them? Souls. And the children oh. are born. This is oh. why there's okay. a, there's a, still this is still true. There is a cult of these birds in Slavic countries, especially I can say for for, for Polish people. I I lived in big city, but I you know I spent some time in the country. There's yeah. a cult of stoks. This is like the huge crime to disturb uh, nests, or like people are like taking care of the, like old or you know like hurt stokes the stoke is a big thing wow in in, in polish folklore and culture also <clears throat> swallows it would be a great like this is like a blessing for the house if there is a nest mm -hmm. so birds brought luck because birds brought fertility and birds brought this collective souls back so people believe when a child is born not only they get this individual soul, which is like the mortal, kind of mortal soul, right? It's going to Right, well, it's die. almost like the soul versus the, the, I don't know, it's actually, it doesn't quite divide into soul versus spirit, but it, but there's this idea that there's kind of, right, there's kind of like your individual, you know, your life force, your own individual contribution, your own like what we think of, I, I think the reason I'm thinking about it that way is because I think of like Hillman talking about the difference between pneuma and anima, which is not really, yeah, yeah it's kind of, but yeah, this is almost like this, um, this archetypal kind of soul that is um, higher in the sense of, I, I don't know, like, it, it, you know, what, it has, you know, it, it's yeah, right, it's more collective than personal, that I guess that's yes. the best way to look at it. But that's really interesting about the stork. I mean, it's, um, because also when you think about birds, um, a lot of the words that we have for bird, uh, like like a lot of the ancient words for bird, co connect the the words that we have for soul. I mean, you have this in all of them. You have them in in the Babylonian. I mean, the soul becomes like a winged creature. Um, Egypt, you have the you know, but the, Egypt has like six or seven different parts of the soul. This is only two. Like Greeks had two. I <laughs> mean, <laughs> it's like what? But one flies and one kind of just yeah, kind of stays that you know. So. It's um it's so interesting, but that's like a really interesting take on. It. I hadn't heard the bird thing before. That's that's you know that they bring the the souls back with them. That's that uh, wow, that's interesting. Yes, and by bring the the souls back, they they kind of make sure of continuity. Mm -hmm. And it's like and but this can get you you can get extremely lucky. Mm -hmm. So you can get like a soul of somebody in your family, right? Because this is pretty random. There's no guaranteed. Mm -hmm. And when the same soul like travels within one family, this is how the great families are built. Because okay. this child is like blessed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Getting the ancestral spirit, right? It's like... It's like a reincarnation it's... model in a way. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. They, 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 they have to... The other part... Goes yeah. on the earth, but yeah, they don't have to learn like everything. That they are given like wisdom, in, inborn wisdom, right? It's like the idea that after all, they are not born the equal. They are not born equal. These people are not born equal. It's like there is like different gifts. Yeah, and not only this, because when a child is born, and now think you know like the Sleeping Beauty fairy tale. When mm -hmm. the child is born, there are rituals like. Uh, when people died in Slavic culture, I forgot to tell this about uh, when, when we talk about dying, there was a burial was burning uh, of the body. Mm -hmm. But the body was born, ashes. But when the child is born, again, there is, there is a ceremony, the family gathers, everything you can imagine. But also they invite the goddesses. And yeah. Rodzanice came. And, you know, it could be them. It could be another three goddesses. There are always some sort of three goddesses, right? Mm -hmm. But this is very much reminiscence of the fates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, even then they name, you know, I, it, it translates to fate. So okay. the fate comes and it marks the child. There's a mark that humans cannot see. This is like what is going to happen to you. So right. humans have only a bit of wiggle room and the free will is not much there, right? Uh, 
it, things that are going to happen and you can have good faith you can have bad faith and everything is going to be blamed on fates okay and pretty much people do not have access uh, to these places but I have just one story to close this. Uh, okay. You have always stories of heroes going to the underworld. And in classical mythology, it's like always a male hero. And this mythology is so male oriented. So I have to say this, the only person that goes to Valles and comes back alive from this is a woman in Slavic mythology. Ah, okay. And this is just a village girl whose name is Yaga. Uh -oh. <laughs> Who uh -oh. in this story uh, is just a village girl. And mm -hmm. she's not terribly popular. And she's not terribly pretty. And she's somehow an outcast. And she wants a different life. And she... She either wants a different life or she just doesn't care. So she says, like, I can even die. Uh, this life is so boring. It's so that people are boring. People don't know anything. They would just eat and procreate. And this is not for me. So I can go to Valles anytime. So actually, she manages uh, to capture horse. Mm hmm she like she she kind of like fishes for him uh, in the water, and when she captures him, she forces him to take him to Valles, and Valles is in such a shock that a human made it to his world. Then he asks her, "What do you want, girl?" She said, "Like you know, I can stay here. I don't want to go back there. It's boring. Uh, maybe here is more interesting." And he said, "Like." But I can make your life more interesting. And she's like, how? And it's like, I can teach you stuff. Mm -hmm. Because he's a giver of wisdom. And when you think about this, because obviously she becomes Baba Yaga. Yes. But this word. I probably said it when we talk about Baba Yaga. Viejima. It has the element of who know Viejic, she learns wisdom there. What Valles is, what Valles is teaching Yaga in the underworld before he lets her go is his wisdom. But she has to make one promise after she gets alive from the underworld back to life. And this promise is she's never going to share this knowledge with men. Ah. Only women. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. That's really, and that's an interesting, um, yeah. And, and um, so that, that actually puts another whole spin on the Baba Yaga stories, because obviously the, the girls who come to her, it's sort of like they're being vetted as to their worthiness to, you know, uh, receive certain types of gifts. Um, I mean, she may or may not, you know, be imparting the wisdom, but, you know, but yeah, so... That's fascinating. And, and the fact that she's, you know, it's still this idea of the wisdom that comes from the underworld, right? But it's the wisdom, it's the wisdom that women have. And um, and being that the underworld is not portrayed as this kind of evil kind of a place, it's like, no, it's just a wisdom that is inherent to women or that, that women can acquire via this. So Baba Yaga almost becomes... She's like almost shamanic in that way, you know? Oh, yes, absolutely. No, because she's definitely shamanic because, uh, you know, like every village would still have a wise man, like a healer, right? But yeah. he's obviously a quack, <laughs> you know? Right. If things go wrong, you call Baba Yaga, right? But you would call her only when things are really wrong. Yeah. And you know that this is a risky business. Mm-hmm. She can ask for a price. And usually, you know, she will ask for a high price. Mm -hmm. And very often the price would be, because I read a very, very good 
story in this book about Striga. You talk about these creatures. And yes. this is a Striga which was attacking one of the villagers and Baba Yaga. They eventually call Baba Yaga and she's like, I'm not going to help you. This is one of, you know, this is one of ours, right? Why should you help you against my own brood? But they ask her and ask her and she's really killing pregnant women by dozens. This is a revenge. So she eventually says, okay, I, I'm going to get rid of her. But what I want, I want every girl born this year. Mm. You can keep the boys. I don't want any boys. And she takes all the girls born, but she doesn't take babies. She can, she waits still. And, and everybody in the village thinks like, oh, she forgot. And you know, when the girls are like five, six, you know, actually, you know, coherent and helpful she's like yep come with me mm -hmm. and and they're trying to outsmart her and things go horribly wrong you don't do this <laughs> no no you make that you make those promises you don't break them so yeah. yeah that's really that's interesting um yeah that's that's like a whole that adds a whole level of, of nuance to a Bob, the baba yaga story because most people just you know there, there's not there's not really been this kind of uh, backstory on her but it's interesting how you have this girl who is bored with life as it is because think about it I mean when you have women who are intelligent or who are clever um, they're they're usually people who are not satisfied with just doing the the, the same old thing it's like no I, I want to break out of this I want to go beyond this you know probably yes. people like us right <laughs> no, no, because what, what kind of life was there for her right actually there's a fantastic book just published uh, about you know, it's about our grandmothers. This is why I'm into grandmother stuff. Uh, about the village life of a woman in the Poland, like 100 years ago. What was there for them? It's like when you were like a teenager, you were probably given away either to somebody much older uh, because your father made a deal mm -hmm. or if you were lucky enough to somebody your age, but... You don't have any any privileges, any rights, nothing. Like woman is like worth less than a cow in this situation. It's like there's even a, an anecdote in this book that uh, some men took this woman, this young girl from her father, and the father promised a cow with her, and the father did not keep the part of the cow, the cow part of the promise. And the young man returned a girl because he said, I didn't want a girl. I want a cow. <laughs> and, you know, you didn't give me a cow. Take this creature back. It's, it's, it's really it's really funny when you say that, because I think about my mother talking about, because my mother's both Polish and Slovak descent, right? Uh, talking about some women in the family. And she says, yeah, the men there, they pick the women like they picked their horses. You know, they would just like, because some of the women in the family were just kind of like, wow. Um, you know, just, just very, very odd, seemed like very odd choices, let's just say. And then they would, but yeah, they want somebody who is going to be a work hard, you know, like, you know, that's yes. work hard, give you lots and lots and lots of children because, you know, like even in the stories, like really Mokosh, who seems so powerful, there is nothing about her outside and she gave birth to this and she gave birth to that and she gave birth to this and Perun gets angry at her because she sleeps with Alice after he abandoned her. You know, it's like she doesn't have any occupation but sitting by this water and brooding. And well, and also think about the fact that she, you said that there weren't, there were no people or really anything created. So it's almost like she's coming out of the animal kingdom in some way. So she's Yes, being, yes like, because there's a horse and then there's no car. You know? Right, yeah. <laughs> and, well, it's really weird because I'm, I'm, I'm finishing up this book I'm writing on the Morrigan and one of the things that comes up is the idea of 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 Macha in in uh, Ireland, the horse god, you know, as a horse goddess. Mm -hmm. And um, there's one particular story, and I'm not going to have all the details right at the moment, but there's one from Transylvania about a particular saint where it was like two aristocrats who were arguing over land or something, and um, or one had like had gotten a fine team of horses, and he wanted them. So um, for some reason, he ends up taking all the women in the village and like making, wanting them to drive his chariot like horses. And he was whipping them. And the, the woman at the lead, who I guess is associated with a, a saint, a, a Saint Anna or something like that, she refused. And um, 
I don't know. She she's kind of ended up taking on this role as this guardian of the lake, but but it was like the kind of misfortune that kind of came to him because of the the mistreatment, treating women like horses, but and 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 but mistreating them, you know, like we're mistreating the horse. Yeah. And there's there's a story about Maka yeah. with Patrick being um, mistreated as, you know, or also they say the story of Maka at Ulster is also because she's made to run like a horse while she's pregnant that um, and then she curses everybody. You know, the, the way in which one is not supposed to mistreat the woman who is kind of like the horse. You know what I mean? It, it's um, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's an interesting uh you know way of thinking about it but yeah but it seems to me that she's more you know she's more more livestock even even a valuable livestock she's more livestock than than um somebody you know on the same level as perrin or or ballast or, or any oh, absolutely else. not yeah so um it, but it and it tells you a lot about um i don't know i mean well there's that collective versus individual thing again too you know because it's it's like what um you know, it's almost like women, well, okay, but I've always said the feminine is a very collective thing. I mean, at least in terms of how it portrays archetypally. And so if women, if their whole role is kind of reduced to extending the family or extending the, then then really they are sort of just, um, a, you know, a, a contributor to the collective. It's not so much like, so Yaga is somebody who's like, no, I'm going to be somebody in my own right. Yes. No, even if it means being alone with other girls, right? Mm -hmm. Because she's like, I'm not going to have children. I'm not going to participate in this circle of life, which seemingly is Mokosha's dominion, right? Mm -hmm. I'm just going to set myself aside. And in a way, uh, at the same time, like Valas, uh, be a destruct destructive part because she can be very very cruel and she can be very very unpredictable but yes. on the other hand she can secure because when there is like absolutely no other hope and this you know like the healer or the wise man which is completely useless uh and they fail they call her mm -hmm. but they also always call her with the great fear mm -hmm. and when she comes it's almost like inviting something like inviting Valis to this to this boat, right? Or but but it's it's the price. It, there's always a price for it. And what yes. what what's gonna be exacted? Because that's true when you're dealing with this kind of realm, generally speaking. You have to be very, very careful because there's always a price. Yes, but these idiots are always trying to trick her at the end. <laughs> you know? yeah, they, they want something for nothing, right? Exactly. And yeah. it's yeah, and, and it's but it's but it's 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 just a really fascinating take on the whole thing and um but it also talks a little bit about that power of the feminine like the the way in which okay the way like okay look at these creation myths the way in which the feminine is not really involved in it at all it's like very much this very patriarchal thing and then once you start to get this first woman involved then it's like yeah like she has no role she's just there sitting by the water and um you know when he's gotten bored with her and she's lonely picks up with somebody else which is not allowed, apparently not supposed to do that's that's the other thing too right like the men can go off and do what they want and the woman it's just like no no you're just supposed to sit there and um but it, you know but then you know but it's not until you see a human who goes to the underworld makes the underworld journey um who gains that power that we associate with the feminine which was also associated with that underworld even though the underworld is the king is male um it's like no no i can there there is more there in other words there's more there than just what we normally do eat eat sleep crap procreate whatever i mean there's more to life than that and so she represents all of that potential but at the same time you know the, there's a danger to that too like the feminine has that double-edged yeah it's the source of, it's like what jung said it's the source of your creativity and it's also something that can poison you and it's almost like there's there's like all of this effort to try to keep that kind of energy under some kind of control or in some kind of a fenced off area, you know, um, where it's only tapped into, like you say, you know, other, you know, when, when necessary and when, when you're in crisis, otherwise it's, it's something to kind of be, be shunned in a way. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, I just think that that's a really interesting view on what I, I like to call it the dark feminine, but it's the feminine in general, really. Yes. It really is. And, um, and that particular viewpoint. Wow. So uh yeah, well, I was so happy when I found this story because it's like <laughs> so <laughs> it's per yeah, I mean, and it's perfect. It's kind of like um in the way that it sort of explains her her backstory a bit. Mm -hmm. And um 
So, um, yeah. So did you have any other thoughts on this? Because I know we're going to be wrapping up soon, but I just don't know if you have any other things you wanted to talk about today. Oh, I think that I that I said everything I wanted to say about uh, the, the, the topic of creation and afterlife, the, the before and after for humankind. But still, uh, I wanted to show you that still in this book, which is not Hampton mythology, this stories take only this part. Wow. Okay. This so part. Me this this part. Sliver here of the book. Yeah. Yes. The thick part is about what's in between. And maybe we meet for this sometimes, like what's in between? Because mm -hmm. the Slavic world is full of spirits. And every step you take, it's somehow dangerous. <laughs> well, no, everything, everything's imbued with a with with a spirit and you have to um walk, you know just like you have to watch out how you deal with people you have to watch out how you deal with them as well yes and how you deal with nature yeah and we've forgotten how to do that really quite yeah. right um it's uh it's very because because we do everything up here we do everything up in the celestial everything in our head because that's mm -hmm. the thing too um that's an interesting thing too because you know normally i think of the celestial i always tend to think of it in terms of you know, language and logos and 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 the mind, but in this case, I think I feel more like 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 the souls that come from Perrin are more like that that unconscious collective. Um, so they're really actually they're weirdly actually more feminine in the way that they they present. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it, it's you know I don't know it's it's just a lot to think about there, but the but the positioning there. Uh, you can see a lot of similarities with with their neighbors, but there's also kind of its own its own spin on it or its own um, its own way of doing things. So you had told me these are not stories you've been familiar with in the past. You know, I I heard about this guy, right? I I knew they existed. Uh, I heard like snippets. I I knew about Perun. I knew about Valles. I knew about Mokosh. Uh, but this is the first time I read it being uh they put into a uh, the, the story uh with consequences right it's like one story like like bleeding to another story so this is what i said you know like this this book this broski and Rana book it's not just a collection of stories this is an attempt of building the big story Right. Well, when you think about it, a lot of mythologies are like that. I mean, even classical mythology is something we always tend to think of it as kind of a unified field, but it's really not. Oh, no, it's no, absolutely. I, 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 I bet that there are other researchers, maybe other authors who are writing Rick's book. No, absolutely. You are completely wrong. But, you know, I don't think that anybody can be right or wrong here at all. Well, it's it's just taking what stories are there, what's evidence in there, and trying to put it into some semblance of order, you know, and yeah, because obviously if it's a story about the creation of world, then, then it falls into this theogony category. And if it has to do with this, you know, a creation of mortals and, and all of these things. And um, yeah, I, I I was not personally, I mean, I, I've heard some of the names before, but I was not personally versed in this. So this has really been enlightening for me. I really found this to be, um, to be really, really interesting. <laughs> so, Thank you. No, and yeah. I was happy to, to share it with somebody who is looking for this because I was walking around and telling these stories randomly to people. May or may not want to listen. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you a story. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> that's me in the neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, that's right. People in the neighborhood, your students, you know, different people. Yeah, your your, your colleagues, whatever you run into. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, um, thank you. I'm gonna probably stop the recording minute and just if you could stay on with me for a second. Okay. Um, thank you. Yes, but thank you so much again. Um, I really enjoyed this, and we'll definitely do it again. <laughs>